So, you know, kind of getting to know other actors was most beneficial to see that they were regular people. Uh, I'd always kind of held them in my mind as, you know, 40-foot gods, you know, that I'd seen on, on the screen. So rather than, you know, meeting someone and then help them helping me get jobs, it was, I think, more, uh, again, just seeing that it was possible uh, because they put their pants on one leg at a time just like I did, uh, so to speak. So, you know, it was always just the more grinding, going in and auditioning, and sometimes auditioning four or five times uh, for the same project, and then not getting the part, but getting very close. Um, I had a lot of near misses early on, but I was just happy to be doing something I loved. Uh, I felt very lucky that I'd found something that made me feel alive. And uh, I knew that that was a pretty rare thing in, in my country. And then a few years later, The Perfect Storm mm -hmm. and the Wolfgang Peterson film. You yes. get cast in that, and it must have been a, 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 a big opportunity. Yes, that was the first time I had a, I felt like a, a really good role in a, in a large studio film. It was mm -hmm. uh, another George Clooney uh, movie. Uh, Mark Wahlberg, uh, you know, Diane Lane, a lot of really good actors, and Wolfgang Peterson directing, another German director, mm. uh, uh, who I would loved Das Boot, uh, which I had seen, and, and was uh, very much an admirer of his. And uh, I got the screen test for him, and he was very positive about it. In fact, the woman, Rusty Schwimmer, that was the bar scene that we saw where my character's kind of clumsily uh, making a pass at her. Uh, she and I knew that we'd be screen testing together, and uh, I haven't thought about this in so long, but we, we, just, we didn't know each other, but we met at a bar in Los Angeles. We decided to meet up at a bar in Los Angeles and, and work on the scene and see if we could do it subtly enough that no one would think we were acting and <laughs> would even notice, and we kind of just were sort of running the lines, and uh, we were very prepared. And when we came into the screen test, we pretended that we'd never met each other. And, and uh, <laughs> that was probably the best acting of the day for both of us. <laughs> and then we were both cast. And uh, she's such an amazingly great actress. And I was able to work with her on a few films. I did a movie called The Sessions. And she came in and did work on that movie as well. Uh, and, uh, and a couple of other films that I was able to suggest her to the director. And they realized that was a good idea. So um, yeah, that's interesting. I think a lot of of, of, of uh, you know, how things happened with other actors was just meeting people that I liked and, and, then, and, and, and had a good working relationship with, and then each of us getting jobs and trying to pull the other one yeah. into it. Yeah. yeah. And then we saw a clip from me and you and everybody, everyone we know. Mm -hmm. And was that your first uh, big leading role? It wasn't the first leading role I'd had, but it was kind of the first... Uh, good, uh, you know, a project that was that I felt was a, was a good project. Uh, that movie, uh, that was Miranda July, uh, mm. was the actress, and she'd also written and and, and directed the film. And uh, she'd come from performance art and was very much an unknown. But when I read that script, I was really moved and and fought very hard to get that part. And that went to Sundance, and uh, uh, the the. Famous American critic Roger Ebert, um, I got to know because he loved that movie. And uh, the last line of his review at Sundance that kind of changed Miranda's life and certainly my own, he wrote something like, as the credits rolled, I turned to a critic sitting next to me and said, this is the best film at Sundance. And she said, I agree. And, uh, that was a, a really big deal. It was a very tiny, tiny movie made for, for nothing. Sometimes we'd shoot on the weekend. Uh, and my favorite part of that film uh, that, that we didn't see is the beginning of the film when my character, in order to try to impress his two sons who don't think much of him, uh, lights his hand on fire in the window in front of them uh, in an ill-fated attempt to sort of impress them, I guess. And it was a really enjoyable way to begin a movie, I guess. It's funny, him beating it on the lawn, trying to put it out, and it won't go out. And he's, anyway, <laughs> he has to wear a bandage for much of the beginning of the movie. But, mm. Scenes like that I love. Sometimes just one scene 
is enough to make me want to be a part of a film. And, and in that case, the whole movie was beautiful, but I was really excited about lighting my hand on fire to start a movie. You know, there's, a, there's an old story about Barbara Streisand when she was at the top, top of her fame as a, an actress and a singer. She, her, her flow was inundated with scripts, and she didn't know what to choose, which one. And she called Billy Wilder and said, how do I know if, if it's a good film? And he said, if there are five good scenes in the movie, you go do it. Ah. Um, so, yeah. It, 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 um, and the rest is just placeholders <laughs> for those scenes. But uh, I heard a story about her when she was first beginning uh, as a theater actress, uh, that she came in late, chewing gum, uh, had two different shoes on, mismatching, uh, a strange fur coat, and just kind of breezed into the audition and uh, had a great audition and kind of sang the pants off it. But right before she auditioned, she said, I'm going to take my gum out and put it out and stuck it under a stool and did the whole audition. And when she left, there was very much a mixed feeling of like, whoa, yeah, but is she crazy? She was great. And uh, the director, I'm trying to remember, or casting director, Joshua Logan, I believe it was, had a strange suspicion, and after she'd left the room, he went and looked under the stool, and there was no gum. It was all, nah. she was all <laughs> just put on this crazy character and showed up. And I did that a lot when I, when, uh, not because of that, but I realized that a lot of times, if I was playing a very extreme character very early in my career, if I came in and said hello, and then launched into this eh, crazy person or whatever, that they would be put off. So I would just kind of show up as the crazy person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I sometimes would lay in the bushes if the character was homeless, and I'd have leaves falling out of my hair and things like that, and walk in, and they'd be like, wow, this is the guy. I mean, you know, he, yeah. he doesn't even have to act. I mean, look at this. So luckily, I was able to get past that to where they would realize, oh, he's a normal person, but can play extreme. People and, yeah. and I could show up as myself and try to <laughs> show them what I could do. Yeah. But going from Miranda July to Ridley Scott in, in 2007, when you mm -hmm. do American Gangster, mm -hmm. what, was, what was that? I mean, it's been a, quite a jump, another big studio film. It was, uh, and that one I didn't audition for, and I kept honestly thinking there was some sort of, sort of uh, paperwork error or mix-up uh, <laughs> that when I would show up, they'd, he'd go, wait a minute, well, that's not who I thought it was. And I kept asking my agent, are you sure I don't have to audition? And he said, no, he's, he's just somehow, well, how does he know who I am? I, I, and my agent's like, I don't know, <laughs> which is not a good sign no. <laughs> you know, when your agent says, how are you getting these jobs? This is really good. <laughs> but um, uh, it was great working with Ridley. He has the capacity to be able to look at um, four different monitors at once, four different cameras running during a scene, and know what's going on in each in each camera. Uh, I and, and he's a very interesting kind of director in that he didn't. Not only did I never receive direction from Ridley Scott as an actor, I didn't see him direct another actor the whole time we were doing it. His direction was. I guess to cast you and trust you to, to do your job and, and on set to say, let's do it again. You know, it was basically it, let's do it again. And um, a lot of times uh, you might finish uh, a series of close ups where the camera is tight on you and they might say, you know, how do you feel? And you'd say, can I have one more? In this case, it would be, he'd say, let's do it again. You'd do it and I'd say, can I have one more? And before you get the words out, Things are already moving because he's decided it's good. And yeah. so, you know, you just trusted him. And I didn't feel underserved as an actor. I didn't feel like he wasn't paying attention. He just, he just trusted his actor, actors. Uh, that said, you know, there are other directors I've worked with who, who like to direct a great deal and like to be very hands-on with their actors. And that's fine, too, as long as, as, long as everything is in service to the story and, and that we're, you know, uh, hopefully serving the script faithfully and, and finding some truth in what we're doing. Uh, as long as we're getting there, it kind of doesn't matter how, how we get there, I guess, uh, as actors and directors. Hmm. But he had four cameras usually shooting simultaneously. A lot of times, hmm. yes. And even if he just had one, you know, he was, he was watching. He was always, always watching. And, and, uh, and like I said, I never really felt uh, worried. Uh, if you, you know, as an actor, if you're working throughout the day and you're not hearing anything, the director's not speaking to you, I learned very, on, very early on that that's not a bad thing. They're just happy with what they're getting. And, and Elvar, uh, you know, 
directs films, uh, and I understand that a director doesn't get much sleep. They're working on the day's work while they're thinking about tomorrow's work and after work looking at yesterday's work uh, to see what they've shot and how it's worked. So I've, I kind of just leave, leave people alone and, uh, and not rush up and say, was it okay, how did I do? Um, more to just you know, realize that, again, if, if uh, it's hard as an actor, we want to be told that we're, we're okay and that we're doing well, but usually no news is good news, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But fast forwarding three years, um, and with this little clip, you scared the shit out of me, and I think everyone in this room, when we saw uh, Winter's Bone, Teardrop, appear on screen, mm -hmm. uh, which of course landed you uh, an Oscar nomination for um, supporting lead. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that experience? And I hear Jennifer Lawrence is doing okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened to her. I hope she's all right. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Obviously, she had an amazing career. Um, and that was her first film. Uh, so, speaking about her specifically, I think she was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I'm normally really friendly to the people I'm working with. I wasn't unfriendly to her, but I thought that it would, it would be good for her if she was a little afraid of me. So I didn't go out of my way to speak to her. I wasn't unfriendly, but just kind of didn't really engage until we were working. Uh, throughout that day, I kept asking her if she was okay, because I, it's hard to see, but I ended up kind of really grabbing her hair hard and yanking her head, and she was always like, I'm okay. Um, she's terrific in the film. Uh, that movie was directed by a woman named Deborah Granick, and at that point, that was the first time I'd worked with a director since my Austin, Texas theater days, where I felt I had a real shorthand. Like, we didn't have to, on set, we didn't have to say much. We'd spoken a lot previously, but uh, I guess I felt really a, a simpatico relationship with Deborah. Like, somehow we were both aiming at the same target. Uh, that was an interesting movie. Again, I was cast without an audition, which was rare in those days, just offered the role. And I read the script and thought it was pretty fantastic. And uh, as we spoke on the phone, I said, I hadn't done any, any, any character like that guy Teardrop at that point in my career, at least nothing she'd seen, I knew. And I said, how do you, how do you come to find me? How, 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 how come you want me to play this role? And she said, I really loved you and me and you and everyone we know, which is a really <laughs> opposite character, yeah. the guy carrying the painting around. Uh, so I was a little confused by that, but I didn't want to question further. And uh, she and I ended up having uh, long conversations about, uh, uh, about Teardrop. Uh, we hadn't met in person. So in the months leading up to, to the shoot, uh, we would speak on the phone. And, and then I began to realize that questions I was asking didn't seem to make sense to her. And I realized to my horror that there had been seven versions of the script that I'd never seen. Because you see, I don't have email, and I still don't to this day. And she presumed that these emails were getting to me. So I was looking at an old script and asking questions, and the script had been rewritten many times. Mm. So when I did get the new script, suddenly the character of Teardrop was, and I'm not speaking out of school, she's even spoken about this. Uh, the, the character of Teardrop was, to me, uh, sanded down, kind of filed down and toothless. Suddenly, she was worried that people wouldn't like him. And I thought, I always begin a project with why is the character, first figuring out what is the story, and then trying to figure out why is the character I'm playing in the story? How does that character serve the story? So we argued very good-naturedly and without ego for the next couple of weeks on the phone, and I ended up saying, you know, you should just call the character Steve or something like that, because there's no teardrop in him, there's no guts in him. And I said to her, the reason this character is interesting and can best serve the story is because if we've got this young woman who has a task, which is to go try to find her father, and if this person 
ends up being the only man to help her, then we need to worry about her. We don't need to think this is a great ally, this is a great friend. We need to think that I'll either rape her, kill her, get her killed, because in the end, I don't. You, you, you see, as an actor, I learned to, to not play the ending. If the movie ends a certain way, then I want to, to begin the opposite of that. So there's a journey. So it felt much more valuable to Jennifer Lawrence's character if Teardrop wasn't a good friend, a good ally. And we should worry about her through the whole film. If this is the only person she has to help her, she's in trouble. And um, one thing about that character, Teardrop, is that audiences would say, wow, I really, I really hated your character at the beginning, but I really love how you changed. And I would think, that character never changes, not once. Mm -hmm. From the moment you meet him, he's marching to his death. And there's nothing about him that changes. <laughs> he's, but their perception of him changed. And I thought that was a really beautiful thing. Uh, yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, teardrop equals, if you have a teardrop tattooed on your face, it equals a, a murder. You have killed someone. Yes, I actually wanted a teardrop, and uh, Deborah uh, wouldn't allow that. Uh, I had an X there. But it was a character who was addicted to methamphetamines, and the makeup woman from New York was amazing. You know, I had to screw up teeth, and I got scratches, and... and uh, a lot of tattoos and neck tattoos and things. Uh, I was allowed to kind of, uh, I designed it all and you know, drew, drew uh, you know, my face and put all these things in. And so we looked through that and kind of the only thing she didn't like was the actual teardrop. I think it was, I'm not sure why she didn't want that. And she also wouldn't let me have the number 13 on my hand because of mm -hmm. a certain gang affiliation, I guess. But. Um, yeah, that was, that was really a fun character to create in that way. Um, and uh, yeah, I think a teardrop does mean a murderer, but, uh, but uh, in this case, it was in a little X. Right there. Mm -hmm. And you talked about before that you, you're not big into smoozing. You come from a small town. And um, what was the aftermath like for you when, when the whole Oscar nominee machine started to roll? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was, um, uh, it was really pretty shocking, I guess, uh, for me and for, I guess, a lot of newspaper critics. One of the major papers in the United States did an article about the Oscar nominees and the last thing said, and who the hell is John Hawks? <laughs> uh, again, I thought it might have been a paperwork error, but no, uh, I, I was actually nominated. It was uh, really, I don't want to sound at all ungrateful, and, and I've, uh, I've grown since, since this, but I was really, um, I kind of came out of punk rock in Austin, out of theater that was kind of rough and low down, and I felt like a fraud in a way, like I'd sold out or something like that. I mean, I got past that quickly, but there was another angle that I lived in a crappy part of Hollywood about three blocks from the theater where they have the, the Academy Awards, and they insisted that a limousine pick me up even though I could have walked. And I knew as I got out of the limousine and flashing light bulbs, I thought, there's, there's people 100 yards from this theater who don't have enough food to eat. And it all felt overdone and strange to me. I don't mean to sound at all ungrateful looking back. It's, it's, it's really a wonderful thing that happened. But at the time, I wasn't, I was putting on a good face, but part of me was just thinking, what is all this Hollywood thing? Um, but it was helpful for my career, and I, I did enjoy the evening. As I sat in the theater, I thought, I'm, I'm amongst some of the best people in the world at, at, at what they do, you know, some of, the, some of the best artists in the world. And most of the, <laughs> I'm not proud of this, but most of the, you know, you show up, I think, at 4.30, and there's no food, and I need food. There's literally <laughs> no food till 11 o'clock. You know, it's a strange... Well, like yesterday, when we had the hot dog. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I get hangry. I get hungry and angry. And um, 
So I just, I was uh, a bit of a mess there and just trying to hold it together in my tuxedo that, you know, they got for me for the night. <laughs> and uh, most of the evening, I just spent in an area of outside smoking cigarettes with Jeffrey Rush, who was kind of just <laughs> sitting there. And that was most of the Academy Awards for, for me. I knew that I wouldn't win, honestly. Uh, uh, it was Christian Bale's year, and he'd won, you know, all the awards that kind of lead up to that. And if an actor or director wins the Screen Actors Guild, yeah. the Golden Globe, the mm -hmm. Critics' Choice Awards, all the way up to it, uh, yeah, I, I didn't think I'd need to be making any speeches. So, yeah. uh, you know, it was complicated. I, I don't mean to sound ungrateful at all, but but just being honest about it, it was I kind of wasn't ready for that at the time, I guess. Uh, for whatever reason. I'd be fine now if anybody wants to nominate me, <laughs> nominate me again, I'm ready, but... Uh. <laughs> but did that influence your next choice? Because you do a, a small film again, um, mm -hmm. Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene, mm -hmm. where you play a cult leader. Again, a pretty frightening character. Mm -hmm. um, oppressive uh, and manipulating. Um, yes. Did that, that affect that he had been through this Oscar run and, and you know, made a big splash? Did it affect that choice at the time? You know, all of those feelings passed quickly, and I and I realized I was just had been very lucky to be part of it. Mm. Uh, uh, so, you know, I I wasn't so much worried about being typecast. I never was. You know, part of being typecast is the word cast. You know, you get to keep working. Yeah. <laughs> so I never worried too much about that. And I was playing such a strange combination leading up to to Winter's Bone of when I first got to Hollywood. Uh, moving from Texas, where I'd been perceived as fairly normal, it was like, psycho. <laughs> I thought, wow, what, is it, what does that say about Texas? Where well, I was just normal there, and <laughs> I show up in LA, and they think, you can play crazy people. So I was playing nerds, and psychos, and psycho nerds, and, and uh, a lot of bad television, but I was learning uh, early on, going back a little bit, in, in a forum that, where a lot of people weren't really watching these shows, so I got to fail in, a, in, a, in an arena that wasn't at the top. I, I, I'm thankful that I've had a, low, a long, slow, slow grind to get where I am because, again, I got to, to, um, to learn uh, and, and have it not be a liability. Um, so doing uh, the character, I think it was Patrick was his name, and Martha Marcy May Marlene, it was such a, a great part, but I... I'd been asked to play Charles Manson before, mm. and this character seemed like that, and I was never interested in, in playing Charles Manson at all. Uh, I, just, I just thought that's an American story that is, to me, undeserving of its intention and uh, overtold. I don't want to censor anybody. People can do what they want to do, but I didn't want to be part of that story ever. Um, and I was worried that this character would be, it was written a little like that. But uh, the, the casting director, Susan Shopmaker, the producer, Ted Hope, these were big time, independent American film icons, really. And uh, I spoke to both of them on the phone and just, you know, was kind of uh, thrilled to even to be speaking to these people. And they were saying, you know, it's not gonna be a Charles Manson thing and um, these young filmmakers, these guys were maybe 23 or 24 years old out of, out of uh, New York University, are, they said they're very special and this is something that you should do. And uh, I did, I'm really glad I did. Um, and, I, and I spoke to, the, to them, to the directors, about my worry about being a kind of a Charles Manson thing. And the idea of playing a charismatic person has always made me nervous. I don't really know how to play charisma. So I thought, you know, again, trying to, what's the best way to serve the story? I thought, if the, young, if the young woman is going to be drawn to him and she's an intelligent person, he can't be too over the top, kind of mustache twirling, hey, I'm a cult leader kind of thing. He's gotta seem like a regular human being to me. And so I took pains to try to make him uh, boring, almost didn't come off that way because of the way it's written, but I, I did not want to try to shine and be this, you know, guy in a white robe that people would kiss his ring or something like that. I made sure that he looked working class and looked kind of regular and uh, 
and just someone that didn't seem like he was fooling people or, or playing people. You know, I wanted to just seem like a fairly serious, straight-ahead human being. But the way the script is written, uh, you know, kind of comes off as a, as a sort of charismatic figure without that being forced or pushed. And you know, something that comes to mind is that it's a very interesting thing to be an actor. You realize that more than you create your own character, the people around you, we all create each other's characters more than we create our own. For example, if I was standing as I am now, sit, or, or if I was sitting here as I am now, dressed as I am, and said, I'm the king of England, and the other actors uh, laughed and threw tomatoes at me on stage and, and urinated on my shoe, the audience would say, that's not the king of England. Whereas if I was dressed exactly as I am and said the line the exact same way, I'm the king of England, and the actors around me cowered and kissed my ring and bowed down, the audience would go, wow, that's the king of England. It's very interesting how we create, how we create each other's characters. And I think mm -hmm. in, the, in that film, that's a, that's, a, that's a great example of yeah. that, that the actors around me were, were amazing. I'm very fortunate that, that they helped, I think, create the character as much as I did in a, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think of what else. In that movie, I got to uh, play a song uh, live. Uh, you know, they actually shot it live in one take, and so it's great to actually kind of score the movie, you know, in that, in that moment. That was really enjoyable to play and sing as well. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Olsen is the, the young lead. She was really, really terrific in the film. And uh, that kind of launched her career as well. Um, that was a really great experience all mm. around. I love that scene when you play the guitar. It's <coughs> almost like a hypnotic scene where you, where you hold the, your congregation in your hand. Mm. But um, moving away from that to your next film, uh, it, it seems like a, a bit of a shift. And it's a beautiful film called The Sessions, mm. where you play a man with cerebral palsy and paralyzed really from the waist down, and Helen Hunt plays the sex therapist that, yes. that uh, uh, is brought in to help you have your first uh, sexual experience at, mm. at 40, what was it, 40? Yes, uh, mid-30s, mid I think, yes. And, and there you literally play, you can only use your face really, mm. to convey emotions and, and uh, interact. Yeah, that was a, a really, a really uh, great character, based on a real uh, guy named Mark O'Brien who, who lived most of his life in an iron lung. He had polio and could only move his head this much. So it was very interesting to be the lead of a film um, and, and only have that much uh, movement to work with. Uh, Helen Hunt was terrific. Mm. Um, it was really challenging as an able-bodied person to play a disabled person. And in this day and age, very politically incorrect. Uh, but my first question to the director, who uh, suffered from polio himself, Ben Lewin, as we sat down to talk about it, was why, why not a disabled actor? And he assured me that he'd looked for three years to try to find someone to play the role. Um, I still have mixed emotions about that to this day, uh, taking a job from, from, from someone way more uniquely qualified than myself. Uh, I spoke to uh, several disabled actors who encouraged me to do it, uh, friends who said, uh, you know, we don't want to just play disabled people either. Um, it was, it was uh, you know, it was, uh, there's a lot of joy in it and a lot of, of, uh, of wonder, wondering if I, if I was doing the right thing and had done the right thing. Uh, in doing it, but it was a story that, that should be told. Mark O'Brien was a really amazing poet. He lived much longer than people thought he had, and I think a lot of that was just the spirit that he had and the drive he had to experience life as, as best he could, I suppose. And the preparation for that role, was it different for you? Um, going through that sort of loss of physicality? It was. Um, you know, he could be out of the iron lung for short periods and, and, uh, and get out of the house because you can't carry a 
thousand pound iron lung with you when you when you leave the house. So uh, he could breathe on oxygen for a short period of time, and so he would go see the surrogate, uh, this woman who he ended up uh, having a sexual relationship with, not a prostitute, a woman in California who had trained to uh, basically have sex with people who were having problems with their sex life, basically a sex teacher, I suppose. But uh, I would notice that on set sometimes, I would be lying on the gurney between takes and uh, felt pretty invisible because crew people would like set coffee on top of you or <laughs> just lay, lay things on top of you like you didn't exist. It was, it was interesting and gave me a tiny bit of an idea of, of, uh, of what another person's life might be like. Um, there's a misconception that you've, you've been involved with two Icelanders, in, uh, two Icelandic projects, because you were in a Sigurors video. Ah, yes. Uh, leaning towards Solace mm -hmm. um, a couple of years after you did the sessions. Yes. Um, playing Al Fanning's father. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, I think uh, that on that record, Sigurós, uh, uh, each of their songs they gave to different directors, and then those directors cast uh, cast actors and made made their own visual story to to match the music. I've always been a huge, huge fan of that band, and was in Canada when when the records were first exported. Ex uh, exported to the U.S. I remember being in a record store where they had listening stations in those days, and it said "brand new," and the cover was so odd looking. And I put on the headphones, was like, "Mm-hmm," yeah. and uh, uh, I was I was lucky to be early on the train uh, just just to get to hear them uh, immediately, at least at least as they got uh, again sent sent overseas. Um, so I was a, a big fan and, and ready to be part of it. I'd always wanted to work with the young actress, Elle Fanning. We were set up to work a couple of times and it had fallen apart. And uh, I drove a few hours out to the desert and we were at some crappy motel and it's still dark and we're getting coffee and getting ready to get in the van, in the van to go shoot. And I said, well, where's Elle? And they said, oh, she can't come till tomorrow. And I said, well, you know I can't be here tomorrow. And they said, well, are you sure? And I said, I, I can't. And so uh, that video, I still didn't meet her. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we're in the video together, but when I'm looking at her doing ballet, it's like a you know a crew member, a male crew member, <laughs> eating a donut and drinking coffee. Look at that guy and pretend that it's Elle Fanning uh, doing a pirouette. Uh, so uh, luckily, uh, on a movie Lowdown, uh, yeah. a couple of years later, uh, Elf, I did play Elle Fanning's father again, and we actually got to, to work together. It's, a it's, it's, it's one of my favorite films, Lowdown. It's a beautiful mm. film. And Joe Albany, a heroin addict that is mm -hmm. fighting his addiction and trying to you know, raise his daughter at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's, again, you combine music with your work? Yes. Well, I didn't actually play the piano. Joe Albany was a jazz pianist who wasn't super well known, but he played with Charlie Parker and Charles Mingus and a bunch of other amazing. Uh, he was he was he was a, a, a white guy who was around and part of bebop uh, beginning to happen. And bebop jazz is a very difficult thing to try to learn on piano. But I was able to fake it pretty well. They had a, a real piano player on set wearing the same shirt that I had on every day so his hands could be on the keyboard, but I, they never, he never had to. He taught me the pieces and he never had to step in. And it's lucky because our hands look nothing alike. But mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that was this uh, filmmaker named Jeff Price out of yeah. New York and uh, he'd never made a feature. And he told me when I met him, this is the only feature I'll ever make. And I thought, that's pretty cool. And uh, that and uh, the script itself and the idea of playing this really tortured soul and, and uh, having Glenn Close play my mother and Al Fanning play my daughter was, was enough to draw me in and I'm really glad I got to be part of that one. You don't seem to mind to work with first-time directors. And I don't. I'm, no. I'm fine with that. I, if, if, I, if, I, Shook. If, I, if I have an idea that they know how to tell a story, uh, then it kind of doesn't really matter to me how much experience they have. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of first-time directors that I haven't worked with that I've yeah. been approached uh, uh, by, but um, 
it's less the experience and more the feeling I have with the person and uh, maybe looking at the short films. In your case, that was a big, a big part of it. Sailcloth was a, a huge reason uh, for my wanting to be part of End of Sentence, for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. And, um, and then um, we're not going to talk about End of Sentence. It's kind of next in line here ah. on my mm -hmm. list. But um, after we, we shot in Ireland, you were going straight to, to do three billboards out of Ebbing. Mm -hmm. Missouri with Martin McDonough, mm -hmm. who is a little bit different from Ridley. Yes, was just not <laughs> talking to the, talking to his actors. Am that's I right? That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, um, yeah, Frances McDormand is a really wonderful American actress that I'd always wanted to work with, and yeah. and I tried. I don't mean to sound coy, but when I met with Martin McDonough, I'd already warned him that I kind of, you know, didn't feel I was really right for the part. But if he still wanted to meet for future projects, I would love to sit down with him. But he's such a charmer. And uh, I kept saying, I don't look like a policeman. I'm skinny and I don't really have that vibe. There are plenty of people you could cast who, because it's not like one of the leads in the film. And when you're playing a smaller role, I feel like physically you need to be really right because you don't have a chance to explain through the movie why you look the way you are and why you're playing the part you're playing when, when you just have to kind of be that person immediately. Uh, I was nervous about that, but uh, the idea of, of working with Francis McDormand and Martin McDonough was, was, was really thrilling to me. And uh, by the end of the meeting, he's like, you know, see you in North Carolina. And I said, no, you won't. <laughs> and of course, I did show up. Yeah. But... Um, uh, yeah, that, that uh, Martin is a, you know, is a playwright, and so working with him as a director, you'd finish a take and he'd have 10 notes, literally. You know, when you do this, do this. When you get to that point, do this. When you walk over there, do this. Don't do that thing you just did there. Keep doing that <laughs> thing you just did there. And so it was really enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mind it at all, because uh, I felt like I was being micromanaged by a really great micromanager, you know, yeah. by someone who, who deserved that and who was really, really great. So... Um, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a great experience, and that film ended up uh, doing really well yeah. for, for, for uh, several of the people involved and for, for Martin. Yeah, it was a, a magical movie, and I feel like an important movie uh, dealing with race relations and, uh, and a way that was so even-handed that people of opposite political persuasions, I think, both identified with the film. What was it again that Frances McDormand decided to do? She, um, it was John Wayne's way of walking, and what was the what was the uh, what was the upper part? I'm trying to remember, but uh, I, I I know that when we rehearsed at her apartment uh, one Saturday afternoon before the Monday that I was to begin to shoot, there was a John Wayne biography there, and and I'd gotten there early and was like, well, "What's that, Francis?" And she said. Oh, you didn't know? I'm basing my character on John Wayne. <laughs> I said, that's really cool. Yeah. And I didn't really get that at all from reading the script, but no, there's something about it. I'm not sure what the rest of it was. I'm sure there's a, a better explanation for yeah. half this and half that, but yeah. she shaped her head kind of up the back, which is really interesting. Mm. And she's a brave one and, and such a good actor. I admired her you know, in Fargo and all yeah. these other films. So I was really excited to work with her, and she didn't disappoint. She was... She was fierce, yeah. In Fargo, where she spoke with a Minnesota accent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm. Um, let's talk about TV a little bit. Uh, yeah. You've been in, in some major so shows. Deadwood is, is very much loved by its audience, and you ended up making a film uh, that came out this year. Mm. That was kind of the, the grand finale. Yes. And, yeah. and Soul Star is, is one of the... The big characters in, in, in yeah, in that. Saul's a good part. Mm. Uh, I um, uh, David Milch is the man who created uh, Deadwood, and he is uh, no offense, but probably the smartest human being I've ever worked with. He mm. was very uh, he'd uh, uh, taught at uh, Yale and uh, was also a former heroin addict. I mean, he was such an odd combination of things. Uh, but intimidating in his intelligence to me. Uh, now I feel uh, I, I, I can speak to him without my voice quavering and, and being <laughs> afraid. But at the time, he was just such a such a force and and a really amazing uh, writer and just such a mind. Um, he never directed an episode, but he would watch every 
scene as it rehearsed and then quote Shakespeare or a William Blake poem or tell a story of how he and his buddies tried to uh, scam uh, Atlantic City Casino by pretending to slip on some water outside the elevator so they could try to make a bunch of money. Just all kinds of odd stories and they never seem to have anything to do with the scene but then you realize, wow, okay, what he's just told us before he kind of walked away really is what the scene's about and you never would guess that as you're reading this Old West scene but he had this way of getting you, of handing you a clue and, and, and a kind of an honest truth about the human condition without stating it really directly. Hmm. Uh, he's a very interesting man. And that TV series was interesting because he wrote the first two or three scripts and then everything else happened as it went. So you might be eating lunch and boom, some pages might show him, hey, we're shooting this later. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, not like a regular show where you have days to prepare. It would often be really on the spot. And so as an over-preparer, that was really great for me to learn to work in a different way and just learn to dive off the, dive into the water without putting on the life jacket, I mm. guess, so to speak. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and now you've just come, come off working with Nicholas Wintengren, mm -hmm. who is um, one of the big directors. Yeah, Danish today. director, yes. Uh, very visual and has, has a, a distinctive style. Mm -hmm. um, but it has a big personality as well, right? Yes. On set. Yes. Nicholas is a very unusual man. Uh, uh, he dances to his own beat, for sure. Uh, but it was very interesting to watch a crew of a couple of hundred people over eight months. A lot of people being very put off by him at first somehow, but by the end of the shoot, all 200 people kind of leaning closer and closer and closer toward him. Yeah. He's got this kind of interesting magic about him. He didn't change, we did, kind of, as, as it went along. Uh, he has an amazing visual style. He is good with, with actors. Uh, and uh, he frightened Amazon so much with his, with his series that they freaked out and backed away and took their name off of it, actually. And he said, well, they like Walmart. They sell batteries and diapers. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know anything about making movies anyway. And so that didn't bother him at all. Uh, I hope it finds its way. It's hard to find, but too old to die young. If you can handle a story told in a different way than you're used to, I feel like it's worth the effort. Mm. Uh, I'm really proud to have been part of it, for sure. Mm. I feel like this is getting long. Should we just go to questions? I've been babbling about myself no, so long. No, this is great, but we, uh, yes, we will go. Okay. I want to ask you, sort of finally, because you worked with an array you guys of directors. Have to pay for this, right? Is this free? It's free. Okay. All right. Good deal. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I want to ask you because you worked obviously throughout your career with different types of directors and and, and their fickle beasts like actors. Um, have you ever formulated the character and rehearsed it and said yes, this is it, and and stepped onto set? And the director goes, no, 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 this is not what we're doing. And, and how did you deal with that? Yeah, that's part of the problem when you begin to be offered jobs rather than auditioning for jobs, is that sometimes you show up and they're like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, that's a tough situation. Um, yeah, that's happened. Uh, I guess I'll tell two stories. Uh, I worked with Dennis Hopper uh, on, a, on a pretty not very good uh, TV movie for a showtime called Nails, I think it was called, years ago. And that was one of those where I laid in the bushes before I came in and played this very extreme character named Harvey Amen. It was just a very, it meant to be a kind of annoying guy who had a parrot and was uh, in trouble for, I think Dennis Hopper was playing a bad cop and my character was a underworld guy who uh, fenced stolen goods, basically took stolen goods and held them and then moved them along later on. So there's a scene where he comes to find me and uh, 
and we have this confrontation and reach an understanding by the end. Well, I audition, you know, playing this crazy dude, and um, and got the part, and uh, went to Dennis Hopper's house, which was a real thrill to have a, a reading of the script before we began to shoot on a Saturday afternoon, and uh, I read the script just like I had auditioned. This is kind of an opposite story of what you're saying. Um, and uh, went home and got a call from the director the next day saying, one of the actresses, and I know who it is, uh, the lead actress was really put off by your performance at the table reading, uh, thinks that you should be fired. Wow. We would fire you to make her happy because we have to keep her happy. But it's Sunday and we shoot tomorrow and we can't find another actor. So <laughs> you're going to need to just change what you've done. And I said, I auditioned that way, though I didn't do He said, I know, and I'm kind of confused too, but just do me a favor and make it more normal. And uh, it was early in my career and I didn't want to make it more normal. I showed up. Monday, and what I found out as we began to shoot was that Dennis Hopper had my back. He had, he had my back. And he said, do what you did. And so I did. And uh, he was making pronouncements. You know, this is an actor, ladies and gentlemen. You know, that guy was really cool. We would sit on his, he didn't have a trailer, he had a tour bus. And we'd sit on his tour bus and rehearse. And, <laughs> This was 1991, maybe, and uh, you know, Blue Velvet, and he'd been nominated for Academy Award for Hoosiers, and this is a hero of mine and my friends. I'm sitting, and I kept, I kept thinking, my God, I'm sitting with Dennis Hopper, and we're reading the lines. That I can't believe this is amazing, but he had my back that day, and so I carried through with what I did, and when he was on The Tonight Show, which is the, at the time, biggest talk show, in the United States, that's the scene that you know he chose to, to show was he and me, and he <laughs> again mentioned you know my name, and I was not known to anybody. And uh, uh, he was very kind, man. Um, trying to think of the other story, which would be uh, oh, uh, I, I was doing a, a television show also very early in my career, and. Again, had auditioned and done the character a certain way. And in television, a lot of times they don't get the greatest directors, or at that time in America, they didn't to do, because they just show up for one episode and then leave. In a weird way, if you're on a TV show for a really long time, the director just directs traffic because mm. they just, they, no director is going to film as a director's medium, television as a producer's medium, at least at that time. And the actors who are on the show for 40 episodes aren't going to put up with the director who comes in and says, hey, this is how you should act. It's like, have you been watching for three years? No. I've created this character. You're just a guy who's here for a week, you know? Yeah. So we rehearsed before, right when we got to set. It was a night shoot, and it was a TV show called Millennium, created by Chris Carter, who'd created X-Files. And... Uh, it was this actor, Lance Hendrickson, who's the lead of the show, and myself. And we rehearsed, and the director kept giving me very odd direction that I didn't quite understand. And I, would, I was thinking, though, I'm a guest on this show, and this is the director, and so I'm doing what he says. Lance Hendrickson, the lead of the show, is a very intense man. After the rehearsals stopped, we all went to the makeup trailer to get ready, and I had to have a bunch of tattoos put on. And I was sitting there, and I hadn't even really much met Lance. And I was sitting there, and Lance came into the trailer and said hello to everybody. He's been on the show a couple of years. Everybody knows each other. The new guy, I'm sitting there, and Lance goes, hey, to me. And I said, yes. And he said, you're a good actor. You have a really good instincts. That director, he's a hack. Don't listen to him. <laughs> do what you want to do. I was like, but I'm just a get. He said, listen to me. When he tells you to do something really stupid, nod your head, do exactly what you want to do, and as soon as the take is over, run over to him and say, is that what you wanted? And he'll say yes, and you just do what you want to do. 
Very interesting. So I learned that when there's a really bad director, sometimes you take the power back. But luckily, since then, I don't think I've worked with too many bad directors along the way. And in the last 15 years, I haven't worked with any bad directors. So I'm lucky. Ah. <laughs> Indeed, you never know. Sometimes it happens that way. Well, thank you for this, John. Um, let's open up the room for some questions. And, you know, this is a, a friendly environment, so don't be afraid to speak up. You with the camera. <laughs> As a person who saw Harold and Maude 11 times when it came out, I was wondering what you found so compelling in that film. Well, I became a huge Hal Ashby fan. I'd never seen an independent film, and if you think about it, that's a very, uh, very early independent film before the term was much even used. Uh, it begins with, with, with uh, Bud Court playing Harold, and he doesn't really speak for much of the beginning of the movie, and it begins with him, as you remember, obviously, hanging himself, and his mother coming in and says, I suppose it gets very funny, Harold. And, and it was shocking to me, and just, and Ruth Gordon, Amazing, and I think the idea when she says, go out and live, give them something to talk about in the locker room or something like that, the whole thing was beautiful to me. The whole thing was unlike anything I'd ever seen. And, and it, you know, with, with, with Tom Waits and Jack, and Jack Kerouac, I think part of it was go live, go, it's only life. Mm -hmm. Go out there and do something. Go out there and do what you wanna do. Dream, love work, live. I felt like that's what that movie encouraged me to do. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Absolutely. You're good. That, that inspired me. Yeah. I brought a friend's aunt who had aphasia. Mm. She saw that film, and for the next 45 minutes, she was speaking in complete sentences uh. and to the amazement of her family. Uh. And it was that film that we, we took her to. Uh. Uh. Man, that's cool. Anyone? It's okay, I've been talking a long time. I'm sure <laughs> we're all tired. You know you all want to, <laughs> to ask a few questions. Uh, hi. Hey, I saw you last night. Yeah. yeah. Um, since the portrayal of disabled characters is often a very controversial topic, I'm curious, did you face any backlash for your portrayal of O'Brien? Yeah, this was, I would say, I'm trying to think of when we shot, because time has a lot to do with this too. We've learned, I think, more along the way, and we learn more every day about. I, I feel like, I know in, in, my, in my schooling in Minnesota, I was lucky to be taught, even though it was a very Scandinavian, kind of all white, small town, I was taught that everyone is equal. And I was taught that by my mother's example, that women have value. But I was never really, you know, the disabled kids were just moved away. You know, I, I wasn't really taught that, that they were equal. Uh, so luckily, I feel like we've, 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 we've begun to learn more about the worth of, of, of all of us as human beings, hopefully. I did face a little backlash at, at some of those screenings. You know, it was, and understandably so, you know. I, to this day, have some regret around that, although it was a very joyful time, and I'm not asking for people to tell me that it was okay, you know. But I did take heart in, in the disabled people that said, it's okay, you know. You did okay, and you did well. Um, there was a little backlash here and there, but, but never really angry or, or, or terribly mean, although maybe it was deserved, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. And you worked with um, a disabled person in, in the film that's coming out now, The Peanut Butter Falcon, he had Down Syndrome. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Zach Godson is an actor who, it's his first movie and he's the lead alongside Shia LaBeouf. Uh, I play a kind of a one-note uh, bad guy, uh, not my most shining work, but I'm super proud to be in the movie because it's just gorgeously beautiful. 
I hope that Peanut Butter Falcon comes here. Yeah. And I hope that you get to see it. Uh, again, there were kids with Downs in my town. And I knew some of them. But I always had a discomfort because I, I was never really taught or exposed in the proper way to human beings that were, that were different in that way. Uh, as I got to know Zach, I thought I would, well, I would begin to seek him out when we weren't shooting because I wanted to be his friend. He was just really cool. He was just a really cool person. Mm. Uh, really funny, uh, great sense of humor, and super loving, and uh, I'm attracted to that. Yeah, I had the privilege of, my sister had Downs, and she was mm -hmm. older than me, so I had the privilege of being raised in a, with a sister. Um, yeah, I'm glad we got to work Peanut Butter Falcon, and yeah. that's, a, that's a good, good thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of more questions before we, we wrap <laughs> up. <laughs> oh yeah. For the one and a half hour. Uh, I'm wondering, is there any kind of uh, specific character that you really want to play but you haven't have chance to? Like maybe a vampire or <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. You know, I get asked that sometimes and I feel like the that that things come to me more than I look for them. Like I feel often feel like whatever's supposed to come will. Um, I, I maybe should write something or, or develop something around something I'd like to do, but I, 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 feel, I feel like I'm, I'd, I'd force that in a way. So I, I, I love playing music in movies, but I've gotten to do that a lot of times now. Uh, I, I did a movie called Unlovable that I, I don't know if it's streaming or not, but I got to write a bunch of songs and play a bunch of songs uh, for the film. It was such a low-budget movie that, that I got to do all of that. Uh, that's a pretty cool film. But I think that all I really look for is an amazing story, uh, an ama you know, a really good character within that story, and then really good people around m myself who are going to tell that story. So it kind of doesn't matter to me what the part is as long as I, I feel, uh, yeah, that I love the script, uh, I love the character, and I love the people that, that I get to work with. So that's a good question, though, and it sets my mind moving uh, to try to maybe think of, of something that I haven't done, but I've, I've been doing this. Well, I've been an actor. I started when I was 15. I'm 60 now, so 40, 45 years I've, I've, I've been an actor, and I feel like I've gotten to play such a wide variety. I don't feel like I'm missing anything yet, but, but maybe I should, I should play a vampire. <laughs> so you would perhaps do a superhero? <laughs> if it was the Citizen Kane of superhero movies, yeah. yeah. The Speed Reader? Huh? The Speed Reader? The Speed Reader? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If that's a superpower. <laughs> that would be my superpower. Yeah. It's one thing to uh, have a success as an actor in Hollywood. How, how do you feel about your success as a person? Uh -huh. Are you able to survive or, and not become a Hollywood train wreck? You know, how, what do you do? Well, I was lucky. I think that things took so long you know, for me. I, I've always been a youthful spirit. Uh, I think that if I'd have had some sort of success, even in my 20s, it would have been harder for me. So, you know, the Academy Award nomination happened. I was, you know, I was probably, I guess, I would have been 50, in my 50s already. So that was lucky for me. And I come from a really good family. And, um, and I come from Minnesota, which is a place where you don't show off, you know. You don't, uh, you don't get above your raisin, as they'd say in the South, you know. You, uh, and I've had such good friends, and I'm sure I've changed, and I'm sure I've been a pain in the ass a few times, uh, but mostly I, I, I've, I've been given the gift of, of, of knowing how lucky I am to, to, to f have found something I love to do, and to have been given encouragement to continue to do it, and to be in a business where it feels like the circus, it feels like you're not really... It's hard work, but a part of it is also, gosh, to get to tell stories is just the greatest thing. So I think that's helped me stay grounded. I know that 
sometimes I go back to my small town and I feel like people are disappointed when they meet me because <laughs> there's nothing really very movie star about me, particularly when I'm in my hometown. Um, and they kind of wish that I was maybe more, I don't know, like a royalty or something. <laughs> it's funny. I think some people love that and other people are like, wow, just a regular person. I thought he'd be something special. You know? <laughs> it's funny. Hmm. <laughs> I think that's an excellent note to uh, end our discussion. And our oh, thanks today. for staying and, and coming. Yeah. And thanks, John, for your generosity. Oh, today. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Elva. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic.